Good afternoon. Now, welcome to this worship service. The title of today's message is If You Love Me, You Will Obey What I Command. The key verse is verses 15 and 16. Let's read these verses together. Let's go. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much for revealing Jesus to us through uh, our studies on the book of John. Our Father, may you bless us that we may know him really by having life together with him, Lord. Our Father, may you also bless us that by faith in him, we may do great things, even greater things than Jesus did. Our Father, we have come to this place to worship you, Lord. May you accept our worship and bless us greatly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Look at verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. That's Jesus' understanding. If you love Jesus, then naturally you will obey Jesus' commands. That's how Jesus sees. And that's what Jesus expects from his disciples. The opposite is true too, as Jesus says in verse 24. If anyone does not love him, he will not obey his teaching. Maybe they will do some Christian things. Maybe they develop a lot of Bible knowledge, but eventually they do not obey his teaching. Why? How come things go this way? It's because obeying Jesus' command is challenging and costly. Not only obeying Jesus' commands, but also obeying or living according to someone's instruction is difficult. Whatsoever, whosoever that person might be, or whatever direction uh, the, that person gives you. Let's say your father gives you, gives you his command that you will eat breakfast 7 o'clock in the morning with the whole family. What about obeying that command? Is Difficult. You are all night owls. <laughs> so your father is generous. So he says, okay, 8 o'clock breakfast. How is it? It's hard too. He's really generous. Okay then, 11 o'clock brunch. <laughs> Have mercy on me. <laughs> you say. Obeying someone's command. Well, living according to someone's command is not easy. Whosoever that person may be, or whatever direction that person gives you. Then what about obeying Jesus' command? His way is higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Sometimes we have to deny our own dreams and desires. Sometimes you have to do what you do not want to do. Sometimes there are a lot of pains and sorrows. Sometimes we have to sacrifice a lot of things we hold dear. Who are willing to bear such pains and sorrows continually to obey Jesus' commands? Only those who love Jesus only those who value Jesus more than those things. What about those who do not love Jesus? They may try doing this and that, doing many Christian things, but what? Eventually, they choose what they really value. Then it is, it is not Jesus, but something else they love really. So in Jesus' eyes, while everyone says, I love Jesus. Only those who obey his commands are the ones who love him. 
Based on, the, on that fact, Jesus sees who is who. When Jesus sees those who love him by obeying his commands, he supports them by sending them the Holy Spirit. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Here Jesus describes the Holy Spirit in two ways, another counselor and the Spirit of truth. The title, another counselor, shows that shows the Holy Spirit's main job, that is, giving you counseling service, showing you what is right, what is wrong, what to do, what not to do, where to go. The disciples could understand this term very well, another counselor, because Jesus had been their counselor. Even if Jesus would be gone, indeed, he would have come back to them in the form of the Holy Spirit. The other expression, the spirit of truth, shows the Holy Spirit's truthful character. The Holy Spirit leads Jesus' disciples into the way of the truth, showing them what is right and what is wrong, what they must do and what they must not do through receiving his counseling service all the way, the disciples come to know the truth, really. And they develop the truthful character as well. In that way, they grow in Jesus as men and women of truth, knowing the truth and exercising the truth. Look at verse 17. Let's read this verse together. Let's go. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. The world does not accept the Holy Spirit because it neither sees him or knows him. It does not recognize or acknowledge him, so it cannot accept him. But Jesus said to the disciples, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. At this, maybe the disciples scratched their head, wondering if they really knew the Holy Spirit or not. They were not sure of it, but Jesus confirmed with them that they didn't know him. On what basis? Jesus said to them, for he lives with you and will be in you. As the disciples served the gospel work together with Jesus, the Holy Spirit was with them, helping them. The disciples actually had no idea about it, the Holy Spirit being with them or living with them. No idea about it. But that's the fact. And that explained many things they had experienced, they had done, amazing works of God they served. They could understand that very well. And later when God's redemption plan was fulfilled through Jesus' death and resurrection, the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost would come into them and live in them, in their body. Jesus says, but you know the Holy Spirit, for he lives with you and will be in you. Do you know the Holy Spirit? No answer, huh? The disciples were really like you. Really. <laughs> but Jesus said, but you know the Holy Spirit. Why? For he lives with you. This is what Jesus says to you today. But you know him, for he lives with you. When we serve God's work, the Holy Spirit lives with us, helping us and guiding us. That's how we have come to experience amazing things. When you look back, yes, indeed, there were some mysterious moments we we had. Sometimes 
during Bible study with our sheep, we found, we found ourselves preaching divine message we have never thought about powerfully. And we are shocked. What am I talking about? <laughs> the Holy Spirit was helping us that way. Well, sometimes we were so frustrated because fishing did not go very well. Everyone said, no, 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 no thanks. We were so discouraged and then we were just walking and walking. Then suddenly out of nowhere, some students approach us and ask us for Bible study. <laughs> it's like a fish jumping into our boat. Well, sometimes because of our dedication to God's work, we had no time to prepare ourselves for the finals or midterms. So we were so burdened. Then strangely, uh, for no reason, the professors postponed our finals and midterms only to help us. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, the Almighty God, lives with you to help you and support you in doing God's work. Wow! What great life it is! What great life we have in Jesus Christ! The Almighty God lives with us. Hallelujah. But that's not all. At a certain time, when the certain conditions are met, the Holy Spirit will come, to, into, will come into you and live in your body. As a result, two persons, your own person and the Holy Spirit, live in your body. Wow, this sounds too mysterious. But this is really true. This is a divine mystery. But this is really true. Many years ago, in regard to speaking in tongue, some people challenged me, saying, how do you know that it is the Holy Spirit uh, who uh, 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 prays in you? What if evil spirit is uh, cursing and uh, screaming that way? So if it is the Holy Spirit, do you know his prayer topics? I did not understand the, the, the language. It was obvious to me that it was the Holy Spirit uh, that lived in me and speak, uh, uh, prayed for me. But their question was kind of intriguing. If I knew what the Holy Spirit was uh, praying for, then it means I know the future, what's going to happen really. <laughs> so, okay, I accepted their challenge. So that night I went to God in prayer and uh, pretended to be like a sullen kid, uh, uh, pouting my uh, lips. Uh, he said, Lord, you said that uh, you love me, but how can I know that you love me when you do not let me know your prayer topics? <laughs> so I had a good logic, actually. Yeah? <laughs> I challenged God this way. At the time, uh, several other disciples were praying with me in the uh, church, uh, the, uh, facing to the world, each one individually. And then when I offered that prayer, they were giggling all the way. <laughs> <laughs> Later, they said that they had never heard that kind of prayer. So funny, really. <laughs> <laughs> then, God's answer was, I live in you despite your sins. I was so shocked. I was so embarrassed. The expression of the God's love for me was that despite my sins, the Holy Spirit, the Holy God was staying in me, bearing with all my smelly and dirty sins. Suddenly, I was reminded of all my terrible and shameful sins, and I felt so ashamed. At the same time, I could see his love for me. Because he loved me, he was enduring such smell and filthiness. At this, I shouted, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I will never ask you that kind of thing. I repent. 
Jesus says that on that day, when the Holy Spirit lives in you, you will realize that Jesus is in the Father and you are in him and he is in you. When Jesus mentioned about forming oneness with the Trinity God, he sounded very conceptual and uh, theological. Oh, forming the Trinity God sounds good. I like it. It's not so real. But when the Holy Spirit lives in them, they would really understand what it meant for them to form the unity with Trinity God because it is now reality in their life. After getting the answer and gentle rebuke from the Holy Spirit about his love for me, I thought about it a lot. It was really touching. Living with a, with a, living with a proud person in a studio apartment, how is it? That's real torture, really. Huh? It's, you really hate that, huh? Oh, what about the, even uh, taking a class with a sinful person? Whenever the professor says something, he comes up with his sinful ideas all the way. And, oh, you are really tired of, of that, Daddy. It's really hard. People cannot bear with such people. They hate each other and they be uh, become enemies. That's why when... That's why... People marry because they think they love, but in two years, they hate each other and divorce. But the Holy Spirit, despite our smelly sins, lives with us. And even lives in us, bearing with all our sins and filthiness with long-suffering patience. That is the expression of his intense love for us. And that is the evidence of his amazing humility. Sometime later, as I was meditating on this, I was really amazed at his humility. The humility of the Holy Spirit was perfect. Nothing to add, nothing to improve. Just perfect, so marvelous and beautiful. Through it, I could see what kind of person Jesus was, or how he dealt with other people while he was living in Israel. Jesus was so beautiful in his meekness, in his humility, submitting himself to all those people, really. Some people challenged him. The, uh, even though he was God, some people challenged him or uh, tried to attack him. He simply avoid them, and went to other town. The Almighty God behaved that way. When someone challenged him, he, oh, I'm sorry, and he went to another town. That was how he dealt with all kinds of people. Then I suddenly realized that I had been exposed to God's person, God's character, the perfection in humility. It was really amazing. Wow. I have been exposed to God's person, God's character. There, out of the, my heart, praise and thanks rose. I praised the Holy Spirit with all my heart and my uh, strengths. Then for the next two, year, two days, I became like him in humility, in, like, in meekness, speaking tenderly to my children. When God's glory was reflected on me, I became like him, being so meek and gentle and humble. When I had a humility like the Holy Spirit, nothing was bothering me. Then my daughter Sarah said to me, Dad, today you are different. I answered, yes, you are right. <laughs> I'm different. <laughs> because I have been exposed to God's person. She was surprised. What, what, the, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> and 
and two days later, my sinful nature came back. <laughs> I was really holy. <laughs> Jesus says, On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Today, the Holy Spirit lives with you. Praise God. You can enjoy fellowship with Him and do mighty works of God together with Him. But He also wants to live in you. Wow! That is His desire. Then how? What should we do? And how can He come into us? Seek God and His kingdom. Seek God's kingdom and God's righteousness with all your heart and strength so that you may be prepared as a vessel for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. Worship God in spirit for God seeks such worshipers. In that way, when your spirit is already tuned, the Holy Spirit can come in and dwell in you. Indeed, we are living in the blessed era, the last days when God pours out His Spirit on everyone, on anyone who is prepared. 